Uh, hello everyone, I'm Shu Jian Yu. I'm currently a new associate professor at the UIT, the Arctic University of Norway. Uh, before joining the UIT, I received my PhD from the University of Florida uh, in 2019. And then I work as a research scientist in NEC Labs Europe, which is in Germany for two years. And then I go to the UIT to continue my research. It's my honor to present the general idea uh, of information theory in the deep neural network. So the title of my presentation today is uh, Information Bottlenecks in Deep Neural Networks. Uh, we know that currently the deep learning has achieved overwhelming performance in different areas and applications. It has been applied in self-driving cars, in energy analytics, in healthcare, and also in speech recognition. However, there are still many fundamental properties of a fundamental problem uh, behind the deep neural networks. For example, many people blame that the deep neural network is still a black box because uh, it's very hard for us to understand um, why and how did a deep neural network achieve a certain decision. And uh, on the other hand, it's also very hard for us to uh, identify uh, which components of the input contribute most to our decision. Similarly, there are also some other problems associated with deep, for example, the generalization, which means that in most of the cases, our training distribution is different from our test distribution, which means that even though uh, our deep neuron achieve very good performance on the training set, it's hard to guarantee that it, it can still generalize to a new distribution, to a new test data set. So, how to improve the generalization ability of deep neural to out of distribution is still an open problem and a challenging problem. Similarly, we also, net, we also know that the deep neural net is very vulnerable to adversarial attack, which means that uh, at the beginning, maybe our deep neural recognize, for example, the in input image X with very high per, uh, percent, very convinced that it, it is a Macau. However, if we manually put or inject some imperceptible perturbations or some imperceptible noise to the input image X, the neural network will Im immediately recognize it as another category with a very high percentage say that it is a bookcase. So how can we train neural net networks such that it can be robust to adversarial attack is still an open pro problem. So, uh, in this talk, I will just uh, briefly introduce the general idea of the of very popular information theoretic principle, which is also called the information bottleneck. I will introduce the general idea of information bottleneck and how the different uh, how to use the information bottleneck bottleneck approaches in deep learning, and I will also cover some of the recent advances uh, of information bottleneck. So uh, let's begin the first section. Uh, before introducing the information bottleneck, I just uh, cover a few uh, basic concepts from information theory. There are uh, three quantities or measures that are very, very important in both information theory and the statistical machine learning. Those are the entropy, the divergence, and the mutual information. The entropy expressed as the negative of the integral of the fx log fx. The fx is a distribution of our variable x. Actually quantify the total uncertainty or how many information are contained in our variable x. On the other hand, the divergence uh, between two distributions, fx and gx, actually quantify how different or the, uh, of those two distributions or the distance of those two distributions. It's a measure of dissimilarity. And the third quantity, the mutual information between X and Y, as shown in the figure, actually quantify the shared information. Intuitively, it can be understood as a shared information between two variables, X and Y, which means that uh, 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 only from the variable X, how many information can we get or obtain from the variable Y? So, those are the three basic concepts and uh, quantities in the information theory. 
Now, uh, let's go back to the traditional machine learning setup. Uh, if we uh, did a simulation, uh, we can uh, we know that a good uh, in a typical machine learning task, we have a bunch of training data, and uh, usually it's labeled the data set. We have x, the uh, which is also called the input input representation. We also have the y. Y is always always called the desired response, or it can also be called the class labels. And most of the the essence of machine learning problem is to how can we learn a good representation from the X. So, uh, the usually we also call the, the representation as a feature from the X. So, the one fundamental problem uh, we want to uh, should judge is uh, which T or which representation is useful. So, currently in machine learning community and also deep learning community, there are many different words to describe the usefulness of the representation T. For example, we can argue that T is disentangled, which means that different um, components of T actually represent different properties of X. Uh, if, for example, uh, the first dimension uh, of T just measure the color of input X. And on the, the second dimension of the T maybe measure the size of X. And uh, similarly, the third dimension of T maybe quantify the other properties, for example, the texture information of our X. So we, on the one hand, uh, uh, we hope that the T can be disentangled. On the other hand, we also hope that the T is interpretable. Interpretable is very easy to understand. We hope that the T, the, the representation is understandable by our human. For example, I, just the example I just mentioned, we hope that, for example, we know exactly that the T quantify the color or the size or other information of X, we, in most, we would like to know the physical meaning of the T to make it interpretable. So the problem is that uh, also look at uh, this uh, illustrative example. Suppose our input is, um, is, uh, is a, a image of the cat. And uh, it's very likely that a good trained well neural network can describe the input image uh, as a cat lying on the laptop. So now the T here, the cat lying on the laptop is our representation or features extracted from the X. So how can we judge if the T here, the summarization, the representation is good, is useful or not? We argue that it should also depend on our tasks, which means that, for example, if currently our tasks the task I give you is to uh, determine if there is a cat on the input feature X, then it's uh, in, uh, obviously uh, the relevant features in T um, include the cat is the relevant feature we want to get. And on the other hand, the laptop is maybe an irrelevant features that do not give us any informative information to help us to judge if there is a cat or not in the e input image. On the other hand, if now I change our tasks and ask you to judge how many pixels are there in the input image X, it's very like uh, obvious that in this case, based on these new tasks, both the cat and the laptop becomes irrelevant information because we cannot get any information on the number of pixels only from the, uh, by just know there is a cat or laptop on the image. So what does it mean? It means that a good representation T should also be related, closely related to our tasks. Or in a machine learning perspective, it should be asked to helpful for predicting the class label or for do some downstream tasks. So the why, the why is always important. Now, uh, based on this illustrative example, let us uh, formulate the an optimal representation T in a mathematical language. At first, uh, also from the example we just mentioned that we hope that our T, the representation should be useful and it should, it should be uh, helpful to, for us to predict the downstream task Y. So the uh, pr a preliminary requirement is that we, hope, we should hope that the T is sufficient, which means that the T as the representation of X should contain all the information regarding Y that can be obtained from the X. And um, 
the sufficient in a mathematical meaning that the mutual information between X and T, which quantifies how many information we can get from the Y only from the X. And uh, the reputation requires that the mutual information between T and the Y should also be equal to the mutual information between X and the Y, which means that the T should contain all the information regarding Y that we can get from the X. On the other hand, given all the sufficient statistics and the sufficient representations, we also want uh, the T such that it has the lowest complexity and it is a minimum and is uh, highly compressed, which means that not all the information in X are useful for us to predict the, the to do the task Y and to predict uh, uh, our downstream labels Y, for example, uh, if the T uh, contains the, both the information of a cat and the information of laptop, and if the Y is just to ask if there is a cat or not, then in this case, the information of the laptop is, in, um, although this inf information is in the input X, but it's not necessary for us to predict the Y. So we should somewhat remove this redundant information or noise information from the X. So which means that on the one hand, we hope that our statistical representation T is sufficient. On the other hand, we also hope that the T contains the its uh, minimum and is highly compressed and it does not contain any redundant information from X. So T only contains the relevant information regarding Y, but the least information from the X. So we should, which means that we should at the same time also try to minimize the mutual information or share the information between input and our uh, feature T, the ACEX. So combined uh, these two uh, criteria, two conditions together, one condition is sufficient, another condition is minimum. And uh, we are actually a good optimal representation T should always try to balance the trade-off between sufficiency versus the minimality. And the information bottleneck approach can be just understand as an approximation to learn the minimum sufficient reputation from our training data from X and Y. So the information bottleneck approach are actually very simple. The, the objective only contains two items. The first item is the minimize, try to minimize the mutual information between X and T. And the second item is try also try to maximize the mutual, mutual information between T and Y. The minimization of mutual information between X and T can be understood as seeking the minimum statistics. On the other hand, uh, try to maximize the mutual information between Y and T is some attempt to try to guarantee that the representation itself is also sufficient. So the information bottleneck approach is actually proposed in uh, 2019 uh, uh, to 2000. So. And uh, it has um, currently been applied in many different traditional machine learning and also deep learning tasks. And as, as I just mentioned, the objective only contains two items and it always try to balance the trade-off between minimality and uh, sufficiency. The X is input, T is our Y, or uh, X is input, Y is our desired output or class label, and T is a representation or features we want to learn. So uh, after introducing the basic concepts behind uh, and the objective behind the information bottleneck, so the next uh, section, I will just cover a few of example how to use information theory in kind of deep learning and deep learning. Uh, as I just mentioned, uh, from mathematical perspective, uh, we hope that our T, it's a minimum sufficient statistics. It should remove all the redundant information from X and it also should be sufficient for us to predict our task, our class label Y. And we also know that currently many people claim that the deep neural is a very strong feature extractor. It can uh, extract uh, uh, features from in, uh, in either low uh, 
low level features or high level features. So our first question is that, uh, does the features extracted from the deep neural network or from the current, for example, the VG16 and even state of that transformer, are the features extracted from those deep neural networks are sufficient statistical uh, minimum sufficient quantities? And to verify uh, this theoretical uh, question, uh, we should build on the information plane. The information, the x axis, uh, let me use uh, another. Uh, the x axis of the information plane is a mutual information between x and t. x is the input. Uh, suppose our deep neural networks can be expressed as a Markov chain um, uh, from x to t1, to t2, and to y. Here, x is the input layer, y is our class label, t1 is a first hidden layer representation, t2 is a second hidden layer representation. So, in the information plane, the x axis is just the mutual information between x and t. We can choose adding of the hidden layers. Is x axis is the mutual information or how many information are shared between t, t and x. Similarly, the y axis is the mutual information between y and t, which quantifies how many information of our hidden layer representation or features can provide about one. And as we just mentioned, the mutual information between X and T actually quantifies the degree of compression and uh, also quantifies how many information we get from X and also quantifies how many redundant information we drop out from the X. On the other hand, the mutual information between T and Y actually quantifies how the predictive performance uh, of uh, on Y if we just use the feature of T because we can understand uh, uh, it's very intuitive for us to understand a good representation that we hope that a good representation should always capture as much information as from Y because we need to use T to do the prediction on Y. So we definitely, we hope that our T can capture more information about our class label such that we can, it can also theoretically guarantee that our classification performance is, is good or is satisfactory. So, in the information plane, the x axis is always the mutual information between x and t. The y axis on that is always the mutual information t and y. And then we train a deep neural network from scratch and uh, we observe how the mutual information of these two inf mutual information will change across the training. So definitely at the beginning of the iteration, for example, this, the point A is epoch one we can observe that both the mutual information of xt and yt are very small. This is very easy to understand because at the beginning of the training, the neural network is set up randomly. So we cannot hope that our kind of the random representation can, can capture any useful information from either x or either y. On the other hand, uh, uh, however, uh, with the increase of the training, now the mutual information values uh, 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 moves to the point B. We can observe that the mutual information between either xt, tx, and ty both increases. And uh, then we move to the point C, uh, which, which means that the mutual information between x and t also continue to increase. And uh, similar, the mutual information between y and t also increase. This is very easy to understand because we hope that uh, our neural network to fit our data. So in this sense, definitely we, we can expect that the latent representation T can capture as much information about either X and the y, either Y as we expected. However, very interestingly, if we continue to train the networks, we will observe that the mutual information values then move to the point D and uh, finally to the point E. This phase is very interesting because it suggests that even though the mutual information of T and Y begin to increase, but at the same time, uh, at the second phase of the neural networks, the mutual information of X and T is decreases. Why this happened? Because it may suggest that the neural network, the hidden representation T begin to drop out 
or begin to remove all the redundant, all the noise information in Y or in, in the input X and only keep, only keep the information that are most informative and most relevant to predict over Y, which means that we can obviously observe two training phases from the information plane and extol us the deeper neural network, the training of deeper neural neuron actually undergoes two phases. Two phases. The first phase is a training, a fitting phase. The second phase is a compression phase. In the fitting phase, all the information increases. And in the compression phase, the mutual information between X and T is beginning to decrease. And because of the existence of the compression phase, uh, of the compression phase, we, ex uh, we can explain it as that the deeper neuron begin to drop out the redundant or spurious correlation in our input data X, such that it can only predictive to our labels Y. And uh, because of also because of the existence of, of compression, uh, we can somewhat judge or see that the neural network is beginning to learn a minimum sufficient statistics. And however, uh, this figure is just uh, uh, illustrated in, a, in the most simplest MLP multi-layer perception. And why does this conclusion still hold for large scale network? For example, why it holds for VGD16 or why it holds for uh, uh, deeper O2 encoders or other state of art for example, transformer. And actually uh, um, uh, uh, in the last three years, uh, here at the you know, uh, UIT and also joint work with the University of Florida, we have did extensive work, work to verify if our neural network is indeed to thinking a minimum of sufficient in the hidden layer limitations. And generally based on our extensive loss of work in either top journals or conference, we gradually to uh, convince that indeed the answer is yes. And uh, this conclusion can also explain partially why a deep neural can generalize well because it's naturally internally trying to think, seek a minimum sufficient statistics. And uh, also, um, as I just uh, mentioned, in order to qu uh, quantify the mutual information between X and T, as well as the mutual information between Y and T, we should have a very good estimator between the mutual information. Because we know that if we just uh, use a shell and entropy functional, the definition is the for example, the entropy of the variable, which quantifies how many uncertainty information in our input variable X, is expressed as a negative of the integral of Px and log Px. However, in our machine learning, especially in deep learning area, we, all, we know that in most of the cases of X, the input variable is in a high or actual high dimensional space. Just to take the aimless data set as an example, the input, each sample of the aimless is in a uh, it's in the space of, of the 784 dimensional space. So, which means that even if we still uh, try trying to follow the traditional Shannon entropy functional and trying to estimate the entropy or, to, or, or mutual information, use the Px log Px, it's very, very hard or almost impossible for us to estimate the P, Px or the distribution of x precisely because of the curse of dimensionality. So, uh, which means that a good or reliable mutual information or entropy estimator in high short dimension or ultra high dimensional space is a prerequisite for us to analyze any deep neural networks and apply it to any other deep learning applications. So, also fundamentally, uh, uh, based on the efforts from uh, our machine learning group in UIT and also joint work with the University of Florida, also in the last three years, we also did extensive work to fundamentally improve the quality um, of the estimation of mutual information and uh, entropy in high dimensional space. And uh, we have developed the metrics based entropy functional. The general idea is to estimate information such that divergence between information and entropy without resorting to the estimation of the underlying data distribution. And what how we achieve it is that we define elegantly that the entropy can be expressed as the eigenvalues uh, of the positive definite matrix that are generated from samples. Uh, 
so far, um, I have briefly introduced how can we use information bottleneck theory to judge if our deep neural network is indeed trying to seek a minimum sufficient statistic in its hidden layer. And um, based on this theoretical observation, we can also partially explain why a deep neural network has uh, some capacity of uh, generalization because of this, its ability to drop out the irrelevant or redundant information in X because of the existence of compression phase. We can somewhat explain a little on the generalization performance. On the other hand, uh, another question is that um, if, if it is possible for us to train a deep neural networks just to use the information bottleneck objective, or the question is that equivalent question is that how can we uh, parameterize a deep neural networks, uh, 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 parameterize the information bottleneck with the deep neural networks, or how to train deep neural network with the information bottleneck objective. And the answer, uh, it actually, the, it's also very simple because we know that in deep neural network, the input x, x is the input, and the T1, T2, T3 actually quantify the representation in different levels, different abstract level. The y is our desired response. Uh, response. So the question is how we train the neural network with the objective by maximize the mutual information between T and the y, and at the same time, also minimize the mutual information between T and X. So in order to train a deep neural network with the information bottleneck objective, we know that there are two open questions. The first is that how can we estimate the mutual information between T and Y and the mutual information between T and X? The second is that question open problem is how we optimize, what optimization should we do to achieve uh, this objective? For the first term, the maximize of the mutual information between T and Y, here is a Z. Between Z is, a, is, is the same as T. For the first, the mutual information between Z and Y is mm, the maximize of mutual, between, mutual information between Z and Y is actually equivalent to the minimization of the cross entropy loss. So based on this uh, 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 conclusion, we can transfer the training of neural network with information bottleneck just simply as the minimization of the cross entropy loss plus a new regularization on the mutual information between X and T, which means that in order to use uh, parameterize the information bottleneck with deeper neural network, we just need to the first uh, add a cross entropy loss minimization just plus a new regularization on the mutual information between X and the Z, Z is a hidden layer representation. And um, there are, uh, are many different, different ways to estimate the mutual information between X and the Z. We can use the variational approximation. We can also use the um, metrics based entry functional that I just mentioned. We can also use a KNN estimator or Parson window density. So, um, the, a good uh, and interesting observation is that. Uh, we observe that that a deep neural networks trend with the information bottleneck objective, which means that if we just uh, train a neural network by minimize the cross entropy loss plus a new regularization on the mutual information between X and T, we observe that the network trend in such a way is very robust to the adversary attacks. Uh, we plot uh, two uh, figures um, and test the robustness uh, of two networks. Uh, one is on the M list, another is on the cipher 10, and to either uh, train either a MLP or a VGG 16. And the X axis is the strength of attack, and the Y axis is the classification accuracy. And we observe that the red line is uh, the results trained with the, by the information bottleneck objective. And we observe that with the increase of the strength of the attack, uh, our classification accuracy always holds the highest, which means that uh, a neural network trained by the information bottleneck objective is very, very robust to adversary attack than its competitors. But this is just an empirical observation. Why the information bottleneck is robust to adversary attack is still theoretical, is explaining, is still an open problem. And uh, the, uh, 
the in the section two, uh, we just cover some of the basic usage of the information bottleneck in deep neural networks. Theoretically, we explain that the deep neural network is always thinking, or is always trying to learn a minimum sufficient statistical recognition in its hidden layer, and also say why this can help us to explain the generalization behavior of deep neural neurons. On the other hand, we also mentioned that a deep neural network can be very, very easy to be trained with the information bottleneck by just combining the cross interflows with a minor regularization on the mutual information between X and T. Now, in recent years, actually the general idea of information bottleneck can actually be used in many, many flexible or advanced way to further improve the performance of deep learning in different areas, cover from computer vision to natural language processing. Here, I just uh, mentioned, uh, describe a few of the recent examples. Uh, we know that the BERT is a very large NLP model that has now been used in different uh, NLP applications. And um, when training the, and the now people just observed that um, instead of just train the bird with, the, for example, the cross interval loss, uh, just like the standard way, if we can just train the bird, just to introduce a regulation on the mutual information between X and T, which meant if we can try to trying to train the bird with the information bottleneck objective, it can significantly improve the generalization performance uh, of the bird uh, of the bird in various NLP tasks. The code can be implemented maybe just by with a few, a few lines of code, but the performance improvement is very obvious. And similarly, people are also trying to use the information objective, try to improve the uh, generalization, not only in LP, but also in reinforcement learning tasks or in other some other downstream computer vision tasks. And the highest level idea is just to replace the traditional training by just use the training of the neural net with the information bottleneck objective. On the other hand, the information bottleneck can also be used for some other, for example, the interpretability tasks or uh, salience detection task. For example, so now the example is that given a bunch of uh, uh, labeled samples X and Y, and we want to identify uh, in the input image the X and we want to identify the most salient regions that are informative to make a decision. For example, on the image of the, uh, of the right, uh, this is a cat image and behind the cat, there are many books. So, and the label of this image is a, is a cat. So the question is, how can we identify the most salient regions in this image such that only from this, um, this partial, this region of the image, it can tell us that it's indeed a, a, a label of cat. For example, um, if it's, it's possible that we use a learning-based methodology that, it, for example, just extract the head of the cat, because we know that only from the head of the cat, we can determine this is a category of cat. On the other hand, the background, for example, the book like that, it has nothing to do for us to make a prediction that this is cat. And similarly, on the image on the left, maybe this is a lung cancer image. So the problem, how can we extract the most informative or salient regions, for example, the, the region like this, such that we can only from this region judge that this, uh, there is the cancer uh, behind these medical images. So can, the, this is, uh, can be understood, uh, extract the most informative regions or pixels from the image and such that the extracted pixel or extract is the most informative of our decision why. And there are many works has been done in interpretable AI to do the, uh, the interpret to extract the most informative regions or pixels. But here we want to say we want to say that one can also formulate such a problem with the information bottleneck objective. Then how we achieve this? It's very simple that we just try to learn a mask, uh, the mask aim on the input image, and uh, such that once we put a mask on the image and uh, the extracted area is most informative for us to make a decision. 
For example, uh, suppose the mask is A, and after put a mask, the mask maybe look like this, and after put this mask on the input image I, we can see that this image of the cat uh, is the most can straightforwardly to help us to make a, a decision that this is indeed a, indeed a cat. On the other hand, if our mask is put in the area of this, then we can see that this area has nothing to do with our prediction that this is the Y, this, this is a, indeed a cat. So the problem reduces, how can we learn a good mask from the input space such that the ex extracted area after um, putting this mask is the most informative for our class labels. Then the simplest way um, in the information bottleneck objective is to, we try to maximize the mutual information between the extracted area. The M is a mask, the I is the input, and uh, the I uh, with the product of the, the aim is actually the extracted area. So in the information bottleneck perspective, we, we can just try to maximize the mutual information between the extracted area and the class label C. And at the same time, try to minimize the mutual information between the image input image I and our extracted area. So by formulating this objective, uh, we can see that once the learning is done, we can see that the good mask will always put, uh, uh, put the mask on the head region of the cat. Uh, and another illustrative figure is shown on the left. We can also actually apply the same or similar idea in NLP, natural language processing uh, applic uh, applications in the interpretability application of NLP. For example, if our input is a, is a sentence, I cough a lot at night, there are some many tokens behind this sentence. And the why is just, uh, I ask you to judge if I have a flu or not. Then the problem is how can we extract the most informative words or tokens from the input sentence, I caught a lot at night, such that the extracted sentence or the extracted token is the most informative to us or to help us to judge if I have a flow or not. Then again, we can try to learn a binary ask on the tokens such that after putting uh, the binary mask on the input, and the resulting tokens, for example, just it may contain only two tokens, the cough and the night, such that the resulting tokens, uh, cough and the night, are most informative because only from the cough and the night, we can judge if I have a flu or not. And some other words, for example, I, lot, at, those words are less informative and does not contribute to our decision if I flu or not. Uh, as the last um, application, um, uh, we want to mention uh, one of the recent work also from our group. We try to improve, further improve the generalization performance of our deep neural networks in a sequential um, uh, uh, environment. We know that uh, any deep neural, neural, neural network is a very, very strong feature extractor and um, it de describes many properties behind our images. However, because of the strong of the feature extractor, it's very likely that uh, after putting a VG16 or even the VIT, uh, we extracted the raw features from the input space. But it's very likely that some features are related only to the our category. For example, if we, we want to uh, classify dog with cat, it's very likely that some raw features are closely related to our uh, category, only, only describe uh, the property of the cat and the dog. However, because of the strong of the feature extractor, it's also, it's also likely that some other features describe the information in the background, which means that not all the raw features are extracted by our CNN are informative or are useful for us to do the other uh, downstream task if we change the background element of our, uh, uh, of our images, which means not all the raw features are useful for us to improve the generation of the 
of our classifier in downstream CV or NLP applications. And uh, the question also reduces from the raw features, how can we remove the features that is associated with the background? Or how can we identify the features that are exactly quantify our main object in each of the image? And we call the raw features focus on the main input, main object as a causal attributes. And the image uh, and the features describe the background or some other uh, redundant information or spurious correlation as a spurious, spurious features. So the problem is, can we identify the causal features and identify the spurious correlations? The answer is also yes. And the idea is just again by putting, try to learn a binary mask on the feature space and the zero one and the zero one, such that after putting the mask, on the feature space and the, we only keep we preserve the features, the causal features that are related to our main object. And definitely we can expect if we just use the features that are only related to our main object, we can hope that such a classifier can have better generalization performance in some other new test distributions, even though the background has a, a, a drastic change. And we've also formulate the remove of the raw uh, of the superior cor um, correlations in the raw features in an um, information bottleneck objective, and we indeed also achieve the, the sort of performance in generalization in sequential algorithm performance. Uh, finally, it's a conclusion of my talk. Uh, we have introduced briefly the general idea of the information bottleneck, and mentioned that it always try to seek learn a minimum sufficient mathematically by formulating. These are the trade off between maximize of the mutual information between T and Y, and at the, also at the same time try to minimize the mutual information between X and T. And in deep learning, we mentioned that information bottleneck can help to theoretically understand uh, the, the training process of the deep learning. It's always trying to compress the mutual information between X and T. And as an application, uh, we also mentioned it can improve the generalization and the robustness of deep neuron if we train a network with information bottleneck objective. And the, finally, I want to say that there are apart from the information bottleneck, there are kind of also many other promising information theoretical principles that can be used to improve the performance of deep neural networks. For example, the information maximization, the rate distortion theorism, and also the principle of relevant relevant information, which is also very new. And in our lab in the UIT, and also joined with University of Florida, we kind of trying to use the principle of relevant information in graph and the graph neural network, which is a topic just a tutorial just mentioned uh, a, a few hours um, ago. And uh, we definitely hope that there will be more and more roles of information theory in various deep learning and machine learning applications. Thanks. <laughs>